Hi, everyone, and good evening, and welcome to tonight's webinar, which is all about college application essays. Um, if you watch the live version of this, unfortunately, we experienced some technical difficulties, and I was unable to share my slides, even though I saw them fine, so I do apologize for that. Um, and if you're watching the recording, then great, you should get all the information all in one place. So let me go ahead. I am going to share my screen, and we're going to get started with tonight's presentation. So tonight we're going to be covering, or I'm going to be covering, um, information about our college application essays and some information to help you get started on that process. And the recording for this webinar, this updated recording, will be available at scorewebinars.com. And also on this site, you can get links to several handouts. You don't need this information to follow along with my um, presentation, but it's good to have some complimentary information, some good resources to help you through the essay application process. Um, my name is Kathy Hart. I've been part of the JRA and SCORE at the Top team since 2013, and I am also a former AP English teacher. In tonight's agenda, we are going to cover application essays, examining the personal statements, supplemental essays, how to get started. I'll give you some do's and don'ts to help you with the process, and then also read some sample essays. So you can see on my screen here, um, of the top 10 factors in uh, college admissions, well-written essays round out the top five. And for students who are considering going test optional, by removal of that, that third point, the college application essays only become that much more important. And so when you're considering your college essays, your college application essays, you always want to think about, well, where can I find them? And so there's two places. The first one is the Common App. You can go to commonapp.org. Um, it has 900 member colleges, actually close to 1,000 now, including many well-known colleges and universities, and new this year, all 12 of Florida State Universities. The Coalition app is another well-known platform that students may utilize to apply to college. Um, as of August 1st, 2022, it is going to be fully integrated with the SCORE platform. That's the S-C-O-I-R platform. Students may have this. Um, students high schools might use this platform. And the students should be able to find the Coalition application fully integrated into the SCORE platform starting August 1st. Now let's talk about writing your application essay. So what is the personal statement? The personal statement is the main essay question. It is written universally for all colleges. You're not writing it to specific to colleges. Um, and it gives you the chance to talk about yourself, to tell a story about you. And on my screen right now, as you can see a list of the Common App personal statement prompts, and I'm not going to read through all of them, but if we just look at the first one, where it says some students have a background, identity, interest, or talent that is so meaningful they believe their application would be incomplete without it. If this sounds like you, then please share your story. And so you can see this prompt and the others on the list are designed to elicit a personal story, a personal narrative. Likewise, with the Coalition app personal statements, you get six choices, the six ones similar to the Common App seventh, in that it is share an essay of your choice. And all of these prompts, again, are designed to spark a personal story about the student. Um, just a quick note that the Common App's personal essay is has a minimum word count of 250, a maximum of 650, and the coalition's suggested length is 500 to 650 words. And for Common App, um, if you go one word over that, that, uh, that, um, that maximum, that will cut you off. And we usually suggest that students aim for a good 500 to 600 words. So what do admissions officers say? You know, they do read the essays, the essay matter, the essays matter, and the essay can be a powerful tipper in close cases. 
Now, what's really great about the Common App essay about your personal essay is there's freedom, right? You're not limited to a thesis statement, to three body paragraphs, to restating your thesis in the conclusion. You get a ton of freedom. And really, you're going to see as we go through some of the, the do's of the application essay is a lot of the principles of creative writing are applied to your application essay, to your college essay. So really what is important as part of the process is spending time brainstorming stories from your life, pieces from your life that you can use not only in your personal essay, but in other application essays. So you're gonna begin with you students. All right, so spend some time selecting a topic. Um, you can start out by using the application prompts. Sometimes those elicit a great idea. You can talk to parents, to trusted teachers and counselors and see if they can help generate some ideas. So let's look at some ways where you can find best ideas. And I'm gonna put some questions or some suggestions up on the screen and you're welcome to take a picture. Um, and you can see here that all of these, these ideas are really going beyond what might otherwise be present in the application. So one of your core values, you know, perhaps you're a student who is curious, everyone knows you as a curious student. Maybe you're a student that knows really lots of interesting facts, you could write about one. You could talk about if you have an unusual hair color, something interesting about your height. What was your favorite recipe? What did that, what was the aftermath of that favorite recipe? Here's a few more suggestions. Again, you can take a screenshot, take a picture. Um, and once you have your idea, you do want to start writing. And it's not, again, what you write about necessarily, but it's how you express yourself and how you reflect on that experience that you're sharing. So let's go through the writing process, which is particularly important when it comes to your college essays. So first of all, you want to consider your topic and spend time brainstorming. And please, students, when you're brainstorming, write everything down. A lot of students will come in and say, I have these great ideas in my head. Well, no, let's get them out on paper. Let's get them in a note on your phone. Let's write them out on an actual piece of paper, get them in a doc. And you're going to recall all moments from your story and also reflect on your story's meaning and start thinking about those. You know, what did I learn? Why did it matter? When you go to write the rough draft, which is the second step, silence your inner editor. A lot of times students have these great ideas, but then they just stop because they worry about how does my essay sound? Oh, it doesn't sound good. I can't come up with a great opening line. Don't worry about it. The great part about the application essay and essays is that the magic lies in the revision. Your essay is gonna go through numerous revisions. I usually advise students, think of it in terms of five drafts at the minimum. And then as you get close to the end, you absolutely want to spend some time proofreading, read your essay out loud, share it with a trusted adult, and just to make sure you catch any of those little errors that, you know, it's not uncommon that might escape notice. Definitely start the process early. Rising seniors, it is summer. You've got some time before you go back to school. Utilize this time accordingly and begin the process. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about some essay do's and don'ts. And mind you, these are tips for when you're working through later drafts of your essay. So let's talk about do's. So first and foremost, the essay needs to be about you. Now, there might be other people in your essay. You might write about a favorite sibling, teacher, a parent. But at the end of the day, the majority of the essay should focus on you, your experience, and your perspective. A conversational tone is wonderful to use in your essay. Going back to what I was talking about earlier about creative writing and the freedom that comes with it. You want your essay to have a natural conversational tone. Contractions are great. You can use fragments, you can use dialogue. Imagine that you're telling your story and you're facing the, the reader of your essay, who's in this case, your listener across the table. How would, your, how would your voice sound? What would your tone sound like? 
do keep your focus narrow. So that's really where the beauty of brainstorming comes in. You start maybe with a broad topic like soccer, and then you narrow it down to perhaps something like a single practice or the moment your cleat touches the ball. And when you make your focus narrow, what's really neat is that allows you to enrich your essays with very vivid details, making your essay more readable and engaging. So let's look at an example here. So I'd like to be surrounded by people with a variety of backgrounds and interests. So fairly common idea. And when the student improves the essay, she wrote that night I sang the theme song from Casablanca with a baseball coach who thinks he's bogey, discussed Marxism with a little old lady and heard more about, more than I ever wanted to know about some woman's gallbladder operation. Let's look at a similar example. So in this case, in the first example, the student's talking about wanting to help people, finding inspiration in his family, wanting to expand the lives of others. By taking that relatively common description, the student adds details that make it unique to him. Mom and dad standing on the sideline, a muddy golden retriever's tail, the intention to work with fourth graders. So we can see how those details really make this essay sparkle or the sentence in that case sparkle. This is what we call show don't tell, which is a common creative writing saying. So in, in the creative writing world, it's show don't tell, show don't tell. I remember years ago when I used to volunteer at my daughter's second grade writing workshop on Friday afternoons, and the teacher would always say to the students as they were writing, create a word picture, create a mind picture. And that's what showing does. So we look at if, if the student's writing about fancy lab equipment, and, and instead substitute scales, test tubes, speakers, and Bunsen burners. Well, now I've really got a really clear picture of the scene that that writer is in, and it makes me want to read more. Of course, at the end of the day, you wanna be mindful of the prompt. You don't want your extracurricular essay to drift into a why this college essay. So do realize that there are word limits. There's sometimes specific questions being asked. So always consider the prompt and use that to also help guide your brainstorming. Now on my screen, you can use a, uh, you can take a picture to a screenshot of some of these transition words that are a little bit different, a little bit more conversational in nature that might help you link ideas within um, paragraphs or even between paragraphs. So I'll pause a moment, and of course, you can always pause the recording and take a take a uh, shot here. Another way to improve your writing and to make it more concise and precise is substituting the active voice for the passive voice. So the active voice is going to be the waiter dropped the tray of food. We get a vivid picture of that. The passive voice is going to be the tray of food was dropped by the waiter. It adds on a few extra words and it isn't nearly as descriptive. Now, openings and closings. So let's just talk about this briefly. Um, when students are working on their openings to their essays, this is hard. In my own writing, I find it difficult to come up with a great opening the first time I'm writing. So leave op openings for those second and third drafts. When you have the content down, you know the direction the essay is going to go in, and now you know where you would like to begin. And you can see a couple examples up on my screen. The first one creates a sense of intrigue. Will the student find work? The second one also creates a different sense of intrigue. What matters about the baby blue Sony point and shoot camera? You know, in both instances, we want to read more. In some cases, short and sweet works better. In this one example, no more seltzer water for me. Well, great. Why? Why does the student no longer drinking seltzer water? What happened? Again, we get a nice sense of intrigue and mystery. Conclusions are similar to openings in that they do take some time to craft um, and you, you might not find the perfect conclusion until a later draft. 
And fourth thing to note about your conclusion is you do want to avoid summarizing. And oftentimes, if you give yourself a very interesting, vivid opening, you can go back and use that in the conclusion. And in a few moments, I'm gonna read some essays that worked. And I'm gonna specifically focus on a couple of them, just the openings and the conclusions where you can see that unification of the two parts of the essay. All right, now let me quickly go through some don'ts. And again, these are for later drafts. You're probably gonna see a lot of these in earlier drafts. So definitely, you don't want to tell colleges what they already know, what you think they want to hear. You want to be writing genuinely and authentically about you. Students will take all sorts of different tones in their essays. Some students are naturally more humorous. Others are um, more serious and reflective. That's fine. Again, you know, being genuine and authentic is important. We just don't want to be cynical, condescending, angry, harsh um, in your essay. Please don't regurgitate a, your resume. If you're writing about an extracurricular, narrow down that focus. You can see on this example, during my junior year, I played for singles on the tennis team, served on the student council, maintained a B plus average, traveled to France, whew, and worked at a cheese factory. I might suggest to the students, hey, that's a great sentence. Let's tell me more about, about the cheese factory. What was that experience like? Likewise, if you're writing from your life, from your experience with your family, travel, work, narrow down the focus, perhaps one special religious service, a special moment when you were traveling or an unusual, a humorous one, or maybe what a day in the life looks like at your job. Again, you're always seeking to use the right amount of words and elaborate when needed. So in this case, we can see too many words. Over the years, it has been pointed out to me by my parents, friends, and teachers, and I've even noticed this about myself as well, that I am not the neatest person in the world. Let's just say I'm a slob and go with that. You certainly don't want to bore your reader. Again, when you're writing in an authentic, engaging manner, you likely will not. And just be aware that your reader was only going to skim over your essay, probably just spend a few minutes reading it. Now, talking about oversharing or writing about sensitive topics, um, you know, sometimes students do want to write about a divorce, a death in the family. And so if students are considering writing about these topics, just a few, a few things to keep in mind. So first of all, you want to think about, can I write about this with maturity and clarity? Is there enough distance between the you of now writing the essay versus the you that lived through the experience? Because it's less about the experience itself and more about the resilience, the determination, the perseverance that it took to overcome it. And then ask a trusted teacher, parent, someone who you, who you know will give you sound judgment and who can give you some guidance. Is this a good essay for a college application or is it perhaps something that should stay personal writing such as a, a diary entry? Cliches are fairly common in early drafts, cutting edge, I learned my lesson, I no longer take blank for granted. And when we want to get rid of cliches, here's a couple of tips. So first of all, we can just trust that our story will tell the reader what we're trying to say, that they can draw a conclusion, that they can infer. Otherwise, we might want to keep the idea, but then we want to go back to using those personal details to enrich it. So. Here's a cliche, as I finished the race, I realized I had learned the value of hard work and appreciate the fact that I could accomplish anything if I set my mind to it. So pretty cliche there, kind of some generic statements. The student rewrites it. The finish line was a buzz of body types, short, tall, skinny, and fat, all sharing a sentiment that glued us together. We had done it. We'd conquered our own doubts. Mine were left behind somewhere in the dust. And it goes back to that show, don't tell. Similar idea, spending some time away from home broadens your horizons. Well, tell us how did it broaden your horizons? 
In this case, we have the student describing uh, street corner falafel, Hebrew national hot dogs, ramen noodles. And so we get a real feel that the student is learning something new and is truly becoming part of his adopted city. Another place where empty generic statements tends to come up is when a student might, is writing a why this college essay. I chose College X because College X is committed to learning and I want to learn, learning is important. And if a student writes a statement like that, they could probably swap in College Y, College Z, College ABC, um, and the essay would still not sound any different. Um, so definitely, if you find yourself working on why this college essays, is make sure that you're using specific details to you know, show the college that you're interested in them, that you've taken the time to research their programs. Um, you don't need to use thesaurus.com to come up with the, you know, the most profound words for when something simple like interesting will do. Now, if you're a student who's accustomed to using sophisticated vocabulary, that's wonderful. Um, definitely use that if, it, if you employ it naturally. Otherwise, trust that simple, clear prose will do the trick in your application essay writing. However, don't forget, you don't wish to use slang. Um, this is an essay, not a text, not an email, not a post. And avoid some of those words that might really not add anything to your essay, such as very or a lot. Contractions, don't forget, are OK, because definitely um, you want to have that natural conversational tone. And never, never, never plagiarize, buy an essay on the internet, or let your parents write the essay. And certainly don't recycle an essay unless it fits another college's prompt, which it may in some instances. Proofreading is very important. That was one of our final steps in the writing process. Absolutely go back, read your essay out loud. Don't necessarily rely on your spelling or grammar checker. For instance, I have seen high school written as one word and not get the little uh, spelling squiggle. Um, and high school is always two words. So definitely make sure that you do a good check of your spelling, of your grammar to avoid any um, careless errors. And at the end of the day, remember this essay always comes back to you. And if you think about it this way, if you dropped your personal essay in the middle of your school hallway and a teacher picked it up and your name wasn't on it, could she tell that the essay was about you based on those details that you provide? And if that's the case, then congratulations, you probably have an excellent essay ready to send to colleges. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little quiz on what is wrong with these uh, sentences. So the first one, I entered onto the scene of this terrestrial sphere on a vernal evening in 1994. A, too wordy, B, too much of a thesaurus, C, doesn't paint a descriptive enough picture, or D, nothing is wrong. So in this instance, this is going to be A and B. It's too wordy. It uses very elaborate, unnecessarily uh, elaborate words. Um, also, probably, you don't need to describe the evening of your birth. Here's another example. As a high school sophomore, I was our church's rep to the youth fellowship. I organized youth group events, the largest being the Bishop's Ball, a statewide event for 300 young people. I also played JV soccer for two years. As a senior, I will be playing varsity soccer, but in the off season, as a junior, I coach soccer for my town. A rambles, B covers too many different things. C the comma after ball should be outside the quotes. D nothing is wrong. So this one too is also going to be A and B. It continues on and on. There doesn't seem to be a focus. And again, too much information. Let's settle on a single focus if we're writing about something from our sophomore year. All right, another example. My friends and I love to spend weekend evenings together. We get along really well because we share so many classes together and all of us are in the same two clubs. A, should be one sentence. B, reveals little about the writer lacks focus. C should be my friends and me. D, nothing is wrong. All right, this one is going to be answer choice B. And you'll notice it doesn't say much about the writer. It tells about, you know, it tells about her and her friends, but really doesn't describe anything specific to the student. Here's another one. I had no experience discussing human rights or mandatory minimum sentences. 
what I did have was determination. A, the writer reveals nothing about herself. B, second sentence is too short. C, vocabulary is too simplistic. D, nothing is wrong. And this one is going to be A, the writer reveals nothing about herself. There's certainly some interesting possibilities here. There is a lot of potential, but as the writer continues working on this essay, she should definitely include some specific experiences here. I know it is all in good nature and we all laugh, but it is interesting to see how the tables have turned. A, you use the contraction it's in place of it is to make the tone more conversational. B, needs a comma after nature. C, tables of turn is too colloquial. D, nothing is wrong. So for this one, we actually have a couple different, uh, or actually uh, three, three different areas we can correct. Definitely switching it is to is, or it's, excuse me, will be helpful. Using a comma after nature will help break up the sentence, although it is a little bit long and rambly to begin with. And tables have turned is a bit too colloquial, right? It's a, it's a cliche, it's a common expression. What's really going on? Let's get some personal details in here. All right, so I'm gonna pause here and I'm going to read several essays that worked. And you're gonna notice that these essays have gone through multiple drafts. They're very polished. The students worked very hard on these, but this will give you some, I hope, inspiration as you work through your personal essays. So let me talk, let me start with this first one. So first I'm gonna read two personal essays from start to finish. When I methodically flip through the rows of fabric lining my wardrobe, I'm searching for an exterior that will convey my emotions, creativity, and story to the world. Rhinestones, feathers, sparkles, and ruffles are my preferred modes of communication, unconventional materials that articulate a multitude of feelings that I'm otherwise incapable of expressing in words. Infinitesimal details coalesce into a complete story that embodies my unfettered creativity, my authentic self. My extravagant, eclectic style makes me a polyglot who communicates in many languages. In my childhood, I unwaveringly can communicated through my strange idiolect. An harmonious relationship between dazzling details and exotic fabrics spoke to me in just the way I wished to speak to the world. Fashion engrossed and transported me to a world where I was accepted. There was a certain ambiguity or irony to my language. Its confidence concealed my insecurities, but its individuality was empowering. As I grew older, the dichotomy between my wardrobe and that of my peers became increasingly evident eventually manifesting in confrontation. Why do you always have to be so extra? My best friend asked in utter disgust. I combed my fingers through my freshly curled blonde hair and tussled with the crinkling fabric underneath my glistening homecoming dress in a desperate attempt to be less extra. Tears flooded my eyes, embarrassment incinerated my excitement. My creativity evaporated. Her humiliating words crushed my identity and initiated my quest for normalcy. I long to disappear into the homogenous sea of my peers, even as that antithet antithetical desire stifled my language. For months, I was torn between my conviction to create and my inclination to assimilate. Living in a perpetual state of bewilderment, I succumbed to the opinions of others and watched my confidence disintegrated by my newfound normalcy. Unsurprisingly, I didn't find a balance. Instead, the conflict within me intensified and my mind erupted like a volcano Causing, causing cataclysmic damage to my world. With identity and language in ruins, I scavenged through the ashes of my self-worth, looking for the slightest recollection of my past persona. In retrospect, I was not longing for normalcy, but for acceptance. Time and time again, I abandoned my individuality, desperate for acceptance. Yet each time I was left rummaging through others' opinions, feeling even more lost than when I started. No matter how hard I tried to change myself, suffocate my creativity, or deny my extravagance, someone would always have an incisive opinion. Ultimately, accepting this reality paved the way for my new journey to self-acceptance and allowed me to slowly regain my original language. Gradually, I learned once again to embrace my unique qualities through my elaborate wardrobe. I spe stepped back into my LTA and examined the details that made clothing speak to me. The sequin, tulle, glitter, and chiffon fabrics became the material aspects of my emotions and memories. The mini skirt with rhinestones ignited fireworks in my mind, transporting me to New Year's Day in Cabo. The black Lululemon leggings and Yeezy sneakers carried me back 
to my car accident with distant memories of fear and pain. The pandemonium of New York City traffic generated a faint smile on my face as I examined my silver and gold David Yerman bracelet. The immersive memories were gripping, the dazzling details arousing long dormant feelings. My closet drowned out my desire to be typical, its door once again opened to creativity, supporting my very own language again. Despite others' opinions, I fuse avant-garde textiles with ornate accessories to satiate my hunger for creativity and to unlock and convey myriad stories within me. Each time I step out of my closet, confidence, creativity, and extravagance radiate through me. I flourish, I communicate, I am language. All right, here's another example of an essay that worked. I was seven when I first began to fly. No, not in an airplane nor in my imagination. Seven is when I joined a cheer squad. Interestingly, I've always been, I've always associated that time in my life with ducklings. I remember sitting in the back of my mom's car on the way to my first cheer practice, barely able to peek out the side window when I spotted a family of ducklings in a scraggly patch of grass adjacent to a small pond. While others might not have noticed the tiny creatures, I was fascinated. A stagnant pond on the side of the highway seemed a difficult environment for ducklings to survive. Yet I observed over the weeks and months that they did. What's more, the ducks managed to thrive and return to that pond each spring. Curiously, I began to think there were aspects of my life that were mirrored in the ducks. Ducklings hop before they fly. They have to dare and they have to persevere. My cheerleading career began in a gym with a specific teaching method. Never was I praised for my attempts at new flying skills. Instead, I was reprimanded for not mastering moves more quickly. Hopping brought me a little encouragement. I must have attempted a back tuck thousands of times before I could do it consistently. Even when I landed the move, my coach ordered, do it again. My coaches often barked at my team to do 100 push-ups. While most of my teammates completed a few push-ups and walked away, I stayed. I was always the only one left on the floor, pushing myself past my own limits. Never did I dare cheat myself out of a single push-up. Despite this environment, I continued to learn the skills to become a flyer, the girl at the top of the pyramid, balanced on one leg, smile on, fa on my face. Like the duckling, I had to take risks in order to fly. I was never afraid to fall, even as I got older and we began doing more advanced moves like basket tosses, where I was thrown 10 or 20 feet into the air. I wasn't afraid to fall. I rely on my teammates to hold me up to catch me. We communicate well with each other, sharing muscle memory and trust. What I've always been afraid of is letting down my teammates. We all work so hard and we often didn't win, not that first year and not other years either. For years, we didn't win. Would I have liked more medals? Yes. Yet I keep coming back like the ducks. Were there other factors apart from cheer that helped shape my development and goals? Certainly, my family's values, my early Montessori education, three enduring childhood friendships, my high school science classes, and my internships. But cheer has been consistently present. Now I find myself in a new role. For example, I'm a mentor to younger cheer team members and the coordinator of customer service work. At four or five months of age, after learning to fly, young ducks must undertake a long migration. Now the same is true for me, but I know where I want to go, what's right for me. My wings are strong, I'm ready to fly. All right, so for the next two personal statements, I'm going to read just the beginnings and the endings, just so you can see how the students use an image a saying in the opening and came back to it in the conclusion. So this is the first essay. In the swell of the waves 50 yards away from me, the infamous midnight blue sail chased my bait in hot pursuit. The sailfish hesitantly circled the bait, then went for the strike. As my cork viciously jerked up and down, the crew and captain exclaimed, let it eat. I nervously decided to set the hook, but unfortunately missed the bite. What went wrong in those few seconds? I simply didn't let it eat. I grew impatient instead of waiting for the fish to fully eat the bait. For the rest of that day, let it eat played over and over again in my thoughts. A few days later at the first tournament of the year, I found myself in the same situation. I watched a sailfish strike the same way as the other had, and this time the phrase, let it eat, reminded me to be patient. I let the fish fully eat, and 20 minutes later, we were up one sailfish. Now moving to the concluding paragraph. Fishing has influenced me to become a more patient and knowledgeable overall. Countless hours waiting have trained me to be patient throughout life, whether it be school, hobbies, or personal issues. 
The virtue of patience is helpful in many ways, and I feel blessed to have adopted this trait at a young age. Additionally, fishing has given me the experience and trial and error and has forced me to pay attention to detail. Finally, this sport has taught me that in life, many times the best way to solve a problem requires experimentation and to let it eat. All right, let's look at another one. Again, opening paragraph and closing. Back when I was a chubby, glowing little girl, I was enchanted by a wooden shape sorting cube that included three-dimensional stars, hearts, cubes, and circles. It was a toddler's game made to improve shape recognition, dexterity, and matching skills, a toy that proved to be fun and intellectual. Although it was a fairly simple game, my three-year-old self could never figure it out. Frustrated beyond relief, I tried to put the heart in the star-shaped outline or the circle in the square time and time again. I remember my mom patiently grabbing the right shape, putting it in my hand and bringing it to its proper outline while saying, heart goes with heart, star goes with star, circle with circle, and square and square. Confused by her statement, I would cry out, but why, why? And she would answer, because that's where it fits. All right, concluding paragraph. So whenever I remember the wooden shape sorting toy, I remind myself that just because other people need to put shapes in their proper places, I don't have to. I don't have to conform to other people's expectations because I get to choose where my bar is set. Because even back then, when my mother wasn't watching, I would keep trying to put the heart in the star, the circle in the square. In the end, I would open the lid and put all of the shapes inside the cube, looking down with satisfaction at the vibrant, vibrant blue circles, the red squares, the yellow stars, the red hearts, all mixed with one another without judgment, without bias, shaping one another and filling the cube to its brim. All right, the next two essays again I'm going to read are two sample extracurricular activity essays. The first one is longer, the second one was capped at a length of 100 words. So this one is in response to give us a glimpse of a passion, dream, or mental pursuit that absorbs and delights you. There is a heart that beats with every movement that is made. Every catch has a release, everything a certain weight. This is natural to us when we examine and interact with the tangible world, but when the world is, is constructed by the imagination, it's not as obvious. Such is a mental exercise, a pantomime. From the Greek pantomimus, imitating all, pantomime is an ancient for, for, form of performance and a craft I've been honing for four years now. It is complete nonverbal storytelling, excluding even the mouthing of words. This makes pantomime a universal art. I perform a pantomime about the famous Kiss on BJ Day photograph, another about the technology impacting familial connection, like the heartbeat that is embedded in the style of movement, boundless heart pours into each performance. Pantomime, the way I've experienced it, is the zenith of the creative process. Weeks are spent in conversation incubating an idea. Translating the idea is turning words into invisible objects and silent emotion, pushing past the facade of language and into the raw reality of expression. From there, it's fine tuning. Don't walk through that table. Make sure you actually swallow that drink. It's ensuring that every emotion is clear and real. Pantomime is a zizigy, a carefully selected movement, music, and expression that creates a holistic and speechless work of art. Of all my dramatic endeavors, pantomime has been uniquely rewarding because every component of the composition is dripping with my own creative juices and connected to art form as a whole and the power vested in communication that is unbound by the coils of language. I find even now that I'm failing to truly capture the beauty of pantomime. It is remarkable irony to fall short of imitating an art that is grounded in expression. All right, and then this is a very short essay. It was capped at 100 words. I step out from behind the curtain and the hot stage light shine down on my skin, palms sweat, legs tremble, then the world around me slowly slips away. It is a rush like no other, standing on stage seconds before performing, the excitement continues. When I rehearse for a show or study voice, every single time I forget the world and focus solely on theater. Theater serves as an outlet for self-expression and a means to leap into an uncharted world. My voice becomes a powerful tool. Life without theater is unimaginable. I will always seek opportunities to perform. And finally, another fairly common uh, supplemental essay is a Why This School? The Boston University experience includes an interesting detail, Shelton Hall's top floor study lounge. 
This glass paneled spot with views of the, over the Boston skyline is repeatedly the home to Eugene O'Neill's ghost. What irony. A literary genius constantly surveying students stressed over finals or finishing editing their fifth, hopefully final, draft of an English essay. Spirits aside, what's truly intriguing is how the sum total of the BU experience guides students on a path to solve tomorrow's problems. I want to major in neuroscience. BU combines the fundamentals I need with an in-depth exploration of neurobiology through the CAS program. As I grow in the field, BU's modern facilities and technology will continuously provide research geared towards a variety of advancements from extending regenerative medicine to establishing a stronger presence of health ethics in the medical community. CSN develops new treatments for neurodegenerative diseases, providing a great segue for my research at FSU. By analyzing diseases on multiple levels, I'll explore and extend the capabilities of the human brain. But wait, there's BU Snowboarding and Ski Club, the perfect opportunity for this Floridian to jump outside his comfort zone and develop new skills. From mastering beginner slips to shredding Casper Bowl, in BU's SBC's collaborative environment, I'll make new friends whose warmth and camaraderie will combat the Boston cold. It's not just a campus, but it's a campus rich in history. So I'll immerse myself in my Beantown life as a terrier and as a special breed of problem solver. Now, just to quickly talk about supplemental essays, um, there is a COVID-19 short response. You'll find it on both the Common App and the Coalition. This is in fact, truly an optional essay. And if something such as COVID-19 or another natural disaster impacted you, your grades, your family situation, this is certainly the space in which to share it, but it is indeed truly optional. Now, in terms of these supplemental questions, because you can see the Common App and Coalition um, personal statement prompts. Now, supplemental essays, many are available right now on a college's own website. Many choose to release them through social media. So, you know, give a follow to some of your favorite schools on Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. The Common App rolls over on August 1st. All the essays and deadlines for each individual school are updated around August 1st. Some schools applications open a little later and that's where you can find those supplemental essays. And some of the popular ones, I read two of them, Why This College, Describe an Extracurricular Activity. Others may ask you to talk about a um, choice of major, what you might like to read, and an idea that you found intellectually engaging. Of course, we're here to help you write great essays, whether it's through one-on-one -on -one appointments with an essay, essay ex expert specialist. We do have a larger group boot camp um, that we run with some host and Boca High School. We also do some small group in-person virtual application workshops, and we're certainly here to help you out. Um, if anyone is interested in chatting with me more about some application essay ideas, I am hosting on Zoom only an essay brainstorming session. It will be free. It's next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. And you can just go to www.personalstatement.guru and we will send you a link to the Zoom event. This will not be recorded. Um, and I do ask students to, uh, if, if appropriate to put on mics and cameras and be willing to share ideas with me and their peers. Um, for more information about any of our programs, you can take a screenshot um, of, of the screen here for our directors in our centers in Boca Raton, Coral Springs Weston, Palm Beach Gardens, and Wellington. And over the summer at score at the top, we've got a lot going on in, two addition, in addition to our college application program. We have test prep, we offer courses for credit. And all of our webinars, including this one, are recorded and made available, always free, always on demand at scorewebinars.com. And you can always reach out and give us a, a, a call, a shout, um, and um, ask us more about our college consulting team. All right, and so I'm gonna take this moment to say thank you again for your attention this evening. It's always a pleasure connecting with students and families as they work on their college application essays. And I look forward to seeing you in the near future and have a happy and healthy rest of your summer.
Thank you so much. Have a good evening.